I remember sitting on our old squeaky porch steps, the paint chipping off like it couldn't wait to leave. Just like Dad. Mom used to say he had wheels under his feet and a heart too big for any map. I never really got what that meant until the police came that day, saying Dad's truck was found abandoned by the side of some forgotten highway. I was just seven, clinging to Mom's skirt, not really understanding, but feeling the weight of her silent tears. Mom Jane was a fighter, though. Without Dad, she took on double shifts at the local dinner. I'd often fall asleep to the sound of her coming home late, trying to be quiet, but never quite managing it. One evening when I was about 12, I asked her, Mom, why do you work so much? Aren't you tired? She sat beside me, her eyes tired but kind. Ella, we've got to make ends meet. Life's tough, but we're tougher, right? I nodded, not fully understanding, but proud to be tough like Mom. Then came the hammer blow that was Mom's cancer diagnosis when I was 18. She fought it hard, but it was like trying to hold back the tide with a spoon. She passed away quietly, leaving me with nothing but memories and a stack of bills. College was supposed to be my escape, my dream. I managed to scrape together enough for the first year, but after that, I was on my own. I juggled classes with two, sometimes three jobs, anything that would pay. One particularly grueling night at the campus library, I remember breaking down. I was alone, surrounded by books that seemed as heavy as the world on my shoulders. That's when I first met John. He walked over, his eyes full of concern. Hey, are you okay? He asked. I wiped my eyes, embarrassed. Yeah, just college stuff, I managed to say, a small smile forming. That's how it all started with Jan. He was different, kind, and always there, like a steady rock in my turbulent sea. He didn't have much, but he shared everything he had with me, half a sandwich, notes from classes, even his old, battered laptop. We'd sit together, sometimes talking, sometimes just sharing the silence. It was comfortable, safe. I hadn't felt that way since Mom was around. You know, Ella, John said one day, you're the strongest person I know. You're going to make it, I'm sure of it. I laughed a bit bitterly. Strong. I feel like I'm barely hanging on. That's what being strong is about, isn't it? Hanging on, even when it's the last thing you want to do. I looked at him, really looked at him, and I realized he was right. I was strong like Mom, and somehow I knew I'd make it through, with or without wheels under my feet. College life wasn't anything like those fancy brochures. It was hard, gritty, and it tested you in ways you never thought possible. I remember my second year, standing in line at the financial aid office, my stomach in knots. The lady at the counter looked at me like I was just another number. Next, she called out, not even looking up, Hi, I'm here about my scholarship renewal. I began, but she cut me off. If it's not renewed in the system, there's nothing I can do. I walked away, feeling a mix of anger and helplessness. That's when I bumped into John again. Hey, Ella, everything okay? He asked, his brows furrowed with concern. I shook my head. No, not really. Financial aid's a dead end. Looks like I might have to drop out. John was quiet for a moment. That's rough, but hey, don't give up. You're smarter than half the professors here. I chuckled despite the gloom. Thanks, John. I just, I don't know what to do. Come on, let's grab a coffee, my treat. You can tell me all about it. That coffee turned into many more. John became my go-to person at college. He had this way of making problems seem smaller, more manageable. We should start looking for a job on campus. Might help with the money situation, he suggested one day. I rolled my eyes. You think I haven't tried? It's like everyone's out to get me or something. John leaned in. Not everyone. I hear the library's looking for someone. You're always there anyway, might as well get paid for it. That's how I ended up working at the library. It wasn't glamorous, but it paid some bills. Between stacking books and serving coffees at a local cafe, I barely had time for studies, but I was making it work one day at a time. John and I grew closer. 
He wasn't just the guy who bought me coffee anymore. He was my friend, my confidant. He knew about my mom, my dad, and all the messy bits in between. It was one evening while closing up the library that John said something that stuck with me. Ella, you're going to make something of yourself. I just know it, and I'll be here cheering you on. I smiled, feeling a warmth spread through me. Thanks, John. That means a lot. College was tough, but with Jan by my side, it felt like I had a fighting chance. He was more than a friend. He was a reminder that some good still existed in this crazy, mixed-up world. After college, life took a turn I didn't expect. John and I got married. It wasn't some big fairy tale wedding, just a small courthouse due with a few friends and less fanfare. We moved into this tiny apartment that had more cracks than walls, but it was ours. It felt like a fresh start, a new chapter. Then came the problem. John's mom, Mrs. Smith, the woman was a piece of work. The first time she visited our place, her nose wrinkled like she'd walked into a dumpster. This is where you live, she said, her voice dripping with something that was half disbelief, half disgust. I tried to smile. Yeah, it's not much, but we're happy, she snorted. Happy? John, you can do better than this. And what about kids? You can't raise kids in this. J.N. cut in, trying to ease the tension. Mom, we've talked about this. We're not rushing into kids. We're focusing on our careers right now. But she wouldn't have it. Every visit was a new complaint. The apartment's too small. The neighborhood's not good enough. Why isn't Ella cooking more? It went on and on. One evening after she left, I turned to John, frustration boiling over. Doesn't it bother you? the way your mom talks about our life, John. Ever the peacemaker, he shrugged. She's just worried about us. That's how she shows love, I guess. That's not love, John. That's criticism. There? It's a difference, I retorted. He didn't say much after that. It was like he couldn't see what was so clear to me. His mom's words were chipping away at us bit by bit. Things got worse when she started hinting we should move somewhere better. I lost it one day. John, we can't afford some fancy place. Why doesn't she get that? John looked uncomfortable. She just wants the best for us, Ella. Maybe we could look at some other apartments just to keep her quiet. Keep her quiet? John, when are you going to stand up to her? We married. This is our life, not hers. He didn't have an answer. That silence said more than any words could. So we kept living our life in our tiny apartment with Mrs. Smith's disapproval hanging over us like a bad smell. I loved John, but his inability to stand up to his mom was driving a wedge between us. It was like he was still her little boy, not a grown man married and making his own way in the world. As time marched on, so did our lives, but in different directions. I landed a job at a marketing firm and it was demanding as hell but I loved it. I was climbing the ladder, making something of myself. John, on the other hand, was stuck in the same old job, a manager at a local retail store. He seemed okay with it, but I couldn't understand why he didn't want more. One night, I came home late, exhausted but buzzing from a successful project. John was on the couch, glued to some TV show. I flopped down beside him. You won't believe the day I had. We landed the big account, John grunted. That's great, Ella. I frowned, looking for some enthusiasm. Aren't you happy for me? He turned a bit annoyed. Of course I am. It's just, it's all you ever talk about. Work, work, work. I sat up, stung. Well, sorry for being passionate about my career. What do you want me to do, be like you? Satisfied with just getting by, he shot up. What's that supposed to mean? It means, why don't you want more, John? Why are you content just being this? He didn't answer, just stormed off to bed. I stayed on the couch, fuming and hurt. The tension spilled over into everything. Simple conversations turned into minefields. Then came the day when John dropped a bombshell. He wanted us to move to a bigger place, something more befitting our status. I stared at him like he'd grown a second head. Befitting our status, John. 
We can't afford a fancy place. We're doing fine here, he was insistent. But we can't live like this forever, Ella, and my mom keeps saying. I cut him off. Oh, so it's your mom again. When are you going to stop listening to her and start living for us, John? His face turned red. I'm thinking about our future, Ella. Maybe you should too. That hurt. It felt like he didn't see all the hard work I was putting into building that future. It was like we were on different planets. In the end, we did move to a house that cost us a whopping twelve grand a month. I could afford it, but it was a stretch. John seemed happier, but every time I wrote that rent check, I felt a part of me scream and protest. We were living in a house that was too big, with a gap between us that was growing wider. I lay awake most nights, wondering how we got here. Was it the money, the jobs, or had we just changed too much? Just when I thought things couldn't get more strained between John and me, life threw a curveball. John's dad fell seriously ill. It hit John hard. They were close. Overnight, our already fragile routine got appended. One evening, after a particularly rough visit to the hospital, John slumped into a chair, looking like the world was on his shoulders. Dad's not doing good, Ella. The doctors, they say he needs constant care. I sat beside him, trying to be the supportive wife. I'm so sorry, John. Maybe we can get a nurse to help, I suggested. He shook his head, his eyes distant. No, I've been thinking. I'm going to take care of him. I'll quit my job and move in for a while. I was stunned. Quit your job, John. Are you sure? What about our bills? The rent for this place? He snapped. This isn't about money, Ella. It's my dad. I need to be there for him. I understood I really did, but the practical side of me was screaming. And I get that, John, but we need to think this through. We can find another way to help your dad, I pleaded. He wouldn't budge. No, my mind's made up. I'm doing this. So he did. John moved into his parents' place, leaving me alone in our big empty house. Days turned into weeks. I was juggling my job and all our bills while he was. I don't even know what. Every time I called or visited, it was the same scene. John either glued to his phone or the TV, looking exhausted and frustrated. His mom, Mrs. Smith, was always hovering, throwing in her two cents. One day, I found him sprawled on the couch, a beer in hand, eyes glued to some game. John, shouldn't you be with your dad? I asked. He barely glanced at me. He's sleeping. What do you want me to do? Sit and stare at him. I bit back my frustration. You could look for a part-time job, help out with our expenses. That got his attention. He sat up, angry. Really, Ella? You want me to work now while my dad's lying there dying? I tried to keep my voice steady. We're drowning in bills, John. I can't handle everything on my own. His mom walked in, always perfect timing. Ella, John is doing a noble thing, taking care of his father. You should be grateful. Grateful? The word hit me like a slap. Grateful. I'm keeping our lives afloat while he sits here doing what? Playing caretaker while watching TV and drinking. John stood up, towering over me. You just don't get it, do you? This is family. Maybe if you had one, you'd understand. That cut deep, too deep. I walked out, the sound of his mom's tut-tuts chasing me. I drove home, tears blurring my vision. This wasn't the man I married. This was a stranger living a life I didn't sign up for. The days after John's father passed were tough. I expected things might start to shift back to normal, but they never did. John never went back to work. Instead, he spent more and more time at his mom's place, leaving me alone in our big expensive house, drowning in bills and loneliness. One evening, I came home from work to find John and his mother, Mrs. Smith, sitting in the living room. The air was thick with tension. Ella, we need to talk, John said, not even bothering to look at me. I set my bag down, feeling a knot in my stomach. What's going on? Mrs. Smith, who always had too much to say, started, We've decided it's best if John and I live here. We can take care of the rent now. 
I was shocked. What? This is our home, John. You can't just kick me out. Jian finally looked at me, his eyes cold. It's not working, Ella. You and me this life. I need to start over, and Mom needs a place to stay. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Start over. So you're just going to throw away our marriage just like that? He shrugged. It's been over for a while, hasn't it? We're just making it official now. I turned to his mother. And you, you think you can just come in here and take over my life? Mrs. Smith stood up, her voice sharp. It's for the best, Ella. You and John were never a good match. He needs to be with family now. I was seething. Family? What about me? I'm his wife. John stood up facing me. Not anymore. We want you out, Ella. The sooner, the better. I looked between them, the betrayal cutting deep. Fine, I'll go. But don't think for a second that this is okay. You're both making a huge mistake. I packed a bag with my essentials, my hands shaking with rage and hurt as I walked out the door. John's voice followed me. We're doing what needs to be done, Ella. You'll see, this is for the best. Settling into my new modest apartment felt like a fresh start. It was small, but it was a place where I could finally breathe, away from the stifling atmosphere of my past life with John and his overbearing mother. The walls were bare and the furniture was minimal, a stark contrast to the lavishness I'd left behind. As I was arranging my few belongings, my phone buzzed. It was a message from an old mutual friend of John and me. Hey, Ella, have you heard about Jan and his mom? They're living it up. Expensive clothes, fancy gadgets. Wonder where all that money is coming from. I stared at the screen, a mix of curiosity and bitterness swirling in me. Where were they getting the money? I thought back to the expensive house, the bills, and the lifestyle they had insisted on. It didn't add up. Shaking my head, I typed a quick reply. No idea, Laura. Good for them. I guess, but the question nagged at me. I couldn't help but wonder how they were affording such extravagance, especially after kicking me out and with John not working. A few days later, I ran into another friend, Mike, at the grocery store. Ella, you won't believe it. I saw John and his mom at the high-end electronics store. They were buying like there's no tomorrow. Heard they even sold their family home. Crazy, huh? I forced a smile. Yeah, crazy. But inside, my mind was racing. They sold the family home. Was that where the money was coming from? As I unpacked groceries in my kitchen, a small, unadorned space that was now my refuge, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. I was moving on, building my life again from scratch, while they seemed to be living in a world of luxury built on lies and deceit. I sat down at my tiny dining table, a second-hand purchase, and let out a long breath. It didn't matter, I told myself. I was out of that toxic environment, free from their twisted dynamics. But deep down, I knew the truth. It did bother me. It bothered me that they seemed to be thriving after throwing me to the curb. I had worked hard for everything I had, while they seemed to be enjoying a life of ease and comfort. As the evening wore on, I found solace in the quiet of my apartment. It was mine, earned through my own effort and resilience. I had lost much, but I had gained something more valuable, my independence, my sense of self. For months into my new life, the past came knocking in a way I never expected. My phone rang one lazy Saturday morning, the caller ID flashing John's name. I hesitated, but answered, Ella, we need your help. John's voice was shaky, desperate. I sat up, alert. What's happened, John? It's all gone wrong. We got kicked out of the rental house. Mom and I, we have nowhere to go. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Kicked out? But I thought you had money. There was a pause. The money's gone, Ella. Dad left debts, not inheritance, we thought. His voice trailed off. I felt a mix of emotions, shock, disbelief, and a tinge of satisfaction. Were they really posh all this time, hoping for a rich inheritance? Seriously, it was too much, even for my ex-husband. So, what do you want from me, John? 
We were wondering if maybe we could stay with you just for a while until we sort things out. I laughed, a short, bitter sound. You want to stay with me after everything? John's voice was pleading now. Please, Ella, we have nowhere else to go. Remember the good times. Can't we just... I cut him off. Good times, John? You and your mother threw me out of my own home. You can't just come crawling back now that things are tough. He was silent for a moment. I know I messed up, Ella. I'm sorry. We're just really desperate. I took a deep breath, my decision clear. John, I've moved on. I've built a new life, and there's no place for you or your mother in it. You need to figure this out on your own. But, Ella, no, John, it's over. You made your choice, now live with it. I hung up, my heart pounding. I felt a surge of empowerment mixed with a twinge of sadness. John, the man I once loved, was now just a voice on the other end of the phone, a reminder of a life I had left behind. Later, Lara called me. I heard about John and his mom. Are you okay? I smiled, feeling a sense of peace. Yeah, I'm more than okay. I'm free, Lara, truly free. As I ended the call, I looked around my small apartment, my sanctuary. It was a far cry from the life I had with John, but it was real, it was mine. I had faced the worst and come out stronger. That night I realized that this was my new beginning, a life where I was in control, where my happiness didn't depend on someone else. I had lost much, but in the process I had found myself.